Hello and welcome to this fireside chat of the Center on Regulation and Markets at the Brookings Institution. My name is Sanjay Patnak and I'm the director of the Center. In our series of fireside chats, we explore important topics related to modern day markets and regulations through one on one conversations with regulators, business executives, and academics. Today, it is a real pleasure to welcome Katya Klinova, who is the head of AI, labor, and the economy at the Partnership on AI. At the Partnership on AI, she focuses on studying the mechanisms for steering AI progress towards greater equality of opportunity and improving the working conditions along the AI supply chain. In this role, she oversees multiple programs, including the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. Prior to the Partnership on AI, Katya's graduate research focused on examining the potential impact of AI advancement on the economic growth prospects of developing countries. She worked at the UN Executive Office of the Secretary General and at Google in a variety of managerial roles. She also has uh, degrees from Harvard University, Rostov State University, the University of Reading, the University of Thessaloniki, and the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. Thank you so much, Katya, for being here today. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for having me. It's a real pleasure to join you. So you, you work in a really interesting space, right? Artificial intelligence uh, is one of the fastest growing fields and, and really fastest pacing technologies that we see nowadays. And so I'm curious because you are, you are an expert in the field. What do you think are the most exciting opportunities for AI technology that you see on the horizon? I am truly excited about AI. I, I have to say I don't love the name AI, but that maybe you know, we'll, we can come back to that. But uh, I think the potential is just huge. And the hope is that it's going to raise productivity, uh, raise prosperity in our society, that it's going to make a lot of jobs safer, less dull, um, less physically taxing, more gainful, more dignified. But that, for that to happen, we really need to change the approach and think about workers in the economy as co-creators of AI, as sources of ideas and progress there, and not as costs to cut. That's very interesting. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what you mean by that point? And like, uh, how, how would you kind of like view AI as a supplement to, to workers in the current economy? Right. Um, so AI really is a technology that it, nothing is predetermined about it. It's still, uh, in some sense, in the early days and can be used in, in many different ways. And you can use it to try to automate as many tasks that workers are doing as possible, or you can use it to complement human labor. And um, what we're seeing a lot now is that AI is frequently used in the workplace to surveil workers. And especially that applies to low wage uh, hourly workers. And that surveillance, the collection of data um, happens, sometimes workers don't even realize that it's happening and it's really prevalent. Um, and workers do not hold you know, any kind of IP rights or any way to profit off of that data that is then being used to feed the algorithms, to train the algorithms that can um, replicate their jobs or be used to, uh, to automate those jobs in the future. So we really need to shift gears and think about um, that and how the labor law needs to uh, potentially evolve. Do we need to recognize workers who generate useful data for algorithms as, as uh, producing um, knowledge and IP and uh, something that is then being reused across the economy? How do we um, give credit for that and for the know-how. That's a really important point, especially kind of like because when we look at AI uh, or the new technology, right, which is pretty broad, I think a lot of the laws and regulations and policies we have in place have not really kept up with the pace of technology, right? Completely, yeah, so much. Um, it's such also an exciting time for, for regulation, right, like and watch how uh, the new ideas come up there and the regulatory innovation. Uh, but yeah, there is just so much work to do on that front. Mm -hmm. And so going back to your earlier part, I'm curious, why don't you like the term AI? What would you have instead rather uh, being? Um, yeah, you know, I guess like I'm not waging a war against the term because I don't necessarily have a very good alternative proposal, but I really agree with what Kate Crawford says. It's neither, the technology is neither artificial nor intelligent. Um, and I think the term AI can, can feed that self-aggrandizement that the, the field is really plagued by. Um, it's not, I, I don't like the term artificial because there is so much of human labor 
that goes into uh, producing AI, into labeling the data, into uh, creating uh, good enough data sets that um, the models can be trained on. Mm -hmm. And that work very often is hidden um, and really not uh, given credit and the dignity that it deserves because um, there is a little bit of a perception that if you admit that there are there is a little army of humans who label the data uh, that that is fed into your algorithm, somehow your algorithms are now less artificial, and somehow that's bad, right? So we should depart from that, and we should recognize the work of uh, of people who are often all around the world, and they are working not in tech jobs that are super well paid and um, enjoy great benefits, but they're working through uh, platforms in which they're paid per task, often that per task payments, they do not add up to a living wage. Um, they lack benefits, they lack recognition um, to the degree that tech workers or what we traditionally think of as tech workers enjoy. So we really need to broaden our understanding of who contributes to the quality and the creation of this technology. I think that's actually a really interesting point that you don't hear too often, right? Because I think, as you say, AI is always being built as this wonderful, great breakthrough, but it's only as good as the people that are working on it and that are training it, right? And so you already mentioned one of the potential issues, right? Like the, the loss of like a, uh, the, the role of labor, it's not being acknowledged in, in that case. What other risks do you see with AI technology in your view that are, might be some of the largest risks that we, we face? So from, from my perspective, I, um, what keeps me up at night and what I work on uh, on a daily basis trying to think about is how do we prevent AI from deepening inequality, both within countries, but also between countries and reversing the gains in economic development convergence that we've seen over the past few decades that happened. Um, because really, when you think about it, the, the path to growth has been through um, capitalizing on the, on the access to large labor force in the global south and the competitive, competitive wages of that labor force. Now, if we're moving towards a production where labor is less relevant, we're diminishing that main comparative advantage that has opened the doors for many lower income countries to grow. And that should be uh, you know, a big source of concern for us. And then even within rich countries, within high income countries, we need to be thinking very carefully around job polarization that has already been happening pre-AI and how AI can now uh, just accelerate it and um, have gains occur to people in a few select professions with uh, uh, select STEM degrees um, and, and shareholders, um, but have a, really a lot of people potentially left behind by that quote unquote progress. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up an interesting point because even if we look at manufacturing in the United States, right? Oftentimes in the political debate, um, trade is being blamed for it. But when we look at the numbers, actually uh, more than 80% of any job losses in manufacturing have occurred due to automation, right? And not because of trade. And so that, that is something really important because oftentimes I think it is very easy for politicians to blame trade, blame foreigners, right? But <laughs> who wants to blame a robot or who wants to blame technology because it's innovation? And so I think that's a very difficult tension here to navigate. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, this is the moment when um, economists are, you know, pointing to that, that this is not all globalization, uh, yeah. that technology has played a major role in what happened with the labor market, with labor demand. Uh, labor share of income has been going down over the past few decades, right? Like, and that has happening um, uh, against the backdrop of calling out of middle paying jobs. So really the prosperity has not been being shared neither from globalization nor from technological progress. And so how do we make sure that going forward, the gains that AI brings about are shared equitably? It's a real challenge. It's not gonna happen automatically. Um, mm -hmm quote unquote, we really need to be um, making careful choices, both in regulation, and there is a lot that companies themselves can do uh, to make sure more people uh, get to benefit from this. 
And so you mentioned that the impact on labor, what other major economic impacts do you see uh, of AI going forward? Um, so the, you know, you can go depending on how dystopian you want to go, right? Like in, in, on a very maybe dystopian um, um, front, how do we think about the potentiality for perfect price discrimination that AI could enable by observing consumer behavior, by knowing exactly where my willingness to pay is for, for different things and being able to price me individually exactly at the level where, where I would pay, like stripping consumers from that surplus, right? Like where they really get all of their benefit by uh, from the difference, you know, between what you would be willing to pay and, and what the price is. Mm -hmm. So if you can now perfectly price discriminate everyone, that all of that surplus is gonna go to the producers um, and that would be a major, challenge to the economy, right? Like, and it's kind of like right there at the slightly dystopian is also the algorithmic collusion on the pricing. These are all things that we need to be careful about thinking. Uh, but, but then this is, this is not happening right now, right? Like, or we hope that this is not happening. What is happening very much is the surveillance that I already mentioned um, over workers, over consumers. And, um, what that leads to is that the risks and the costs are borne more and more by workers, the ones that are used to be borne by, um, by the employers themselves. There is this new, really beautiful report out of Data and Society um, called Constant Boss. I, I highly recommend it to, to check out. And it describes how, uh, you know, with algorithmic scheduling, for example, um, I'll, you know, AI being able to predict how many, um, you know, customers you're going to get in your store and being able to dynamically uh, schedule workers depending on, on that consumer demand, that can result into like, in like a sudden short notice um, cancellation of your shift or just your shift being, um, being cut short. And then you go home and this is the cost that is now borne by a worker a cost of a risk of a slow day for a business. It used to be borne by the, the firm that sells, right? Like now workers born it. So these things are making economic impact and real impact on, on people's um, livelihoods. They're happening today and the regulation is, is just not there to, to take care of it. I think you bring up a really important one, which is the, the surveillance, right? You talk about it uh, from the company perspective, the surveillance of workers. But I think um, another area where we see is that a lot of authoritarian regimes are using AI for mass surveillance, like for social credit scoring, which is really getting very dystopian if you think about it, right? And so um, I think you also have the potential these systems to undermine democratic societies, which we already see through the proliferation of deep fakes, of misinformation that, that is rampant in, um, in political campaigns. How do you think we can safeguard against some of these negative applications of AI and especially safeguard our democracies against uh, kind of like the pernicious impact of those? Um, yeah, so the, the partnership on AI that I work for, actually the very, very first report that uh, was put out before my time, just when the NGO got started, um, is, is around criminal justice. And it put out 10, um, 10 requirements for systems that are deployed, um, that are making decisions over people's lives, what they need to satisfy. And like at the time of writing, no systems that were being deployed were satisfying all of these 10. And it really um, is important that we look very carefully at uh, what is being deployed on people, how these decisions are made, um, the surveillance that is being deployed, obviously. The recent European regulation also yeah. talks about um, when you can and cannot use facial recognition and um, limits strictly the number of cases when it can be done, especially in public squares. Mm -hmm. I think the, I think uh, the, the last point is quite uh, nice to elaborate on because if we look at around the world, I don't think there's almost any regulation in this sphere in most countries. But the EU has now come out with a new framework where they plan to strictly regulate some AI systems, including banning AI for mass surveillance, social credit systems, and as you also mentioned, facial recognition technology. 
um, especially as compared to some of the technology that is already being used on a very large scale in China. What is your view of these regulations from the EU that is coming out? I'm sure you have studied them. And do you think the US should follow uh, a similar path uh, regulating similar activities? So the EU regulation, you know, I think it's it's a thick hundred pages more even, right? Like, and it, mm. I think it, I, I'm not gonna pretend that I have thought about all the implications of, uh, of that regulation. And I think it's gonna be something kind of like a little bit of a discovery road. Um, I think the intention of it was to put out minimum requirements mm. um, of it. So they, uh, in some sense, like limited their own scope. And, you know, it is difficult, like we just gotta acknowledge that it is really difficult to build future-proof regulation and to be one of the first movers in the space, right? As a business, you might enjoy the first mover advantage. As a regulator, you don't have the luxury of learning from someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was really glad that they um, put the use of AI systems within employment context within the workplace as high risk and mm -hmm. mandating disclosure requirements, transparency requirements, um, and what they call, I think, um, assessment, just like assessment of compliance. Now, what are these assessments are going to look like? That's really where the devil is, right? How are you going to assess these systems? Um, they're calling for standards there. Um, and a lot of these standards, I think it would be beneficial if they were international, internationally recognized and created with a lot of input from the workers themselves who are on the receiving end of all of these systems. Um, but for now, this is to be figured out. What I think the, the proposal doesn't do, and that maybe has been their intention because um, you know, you cannot cover all, but what I wish I saw there is the discussion on how do you empower workers? So beyond giving them information about how decisions about their promotions, termination um, are made by algorithms, like what, what is taken into account, what is not taken into account, how do you give them power uh, in the workplace to negotiate over that, to, to dispute it, to have recourse? Right, because you bosses have always been wanting since the industrial revolution to uh, observe their workers closely, but workers at least could argue with their boss uh, yeah, around true. their decision. Now, who do you argue with? And um, it is it is a step um, in an improvement direction that at least um, workers are gonna know a little bit more about how the decisions are made. Because right now, this is just a source of. Um, this is a source of insecurity. You know that your time of task matters, but you don't know exactly how it matters. You don't know exactly how long you can take, I'm sorry, a bathroom break mm -hmm. and like when it's going to become a problem and you see some of your colleagues being, um, being terminated because of that. Of course, that just creates insecurity. It creates an anxiety. Uh, it makes... Um, job quality go down. So improving on, on the transparency is a step in the right direction. It's not enough though to empower workers to contest it. And I think that it goes back to an earlier point you made that it's really a lot of these systems nowadays are just black boxes, right? Uh, and we don't know how the arguments work in the background, what the different factors are in that come into there. And I think I agree with, with you that the transparency is really critical here, especially in these early stages before the technology gets so advanced that it's very difficult to impose regulations ex post. Um, and so I wanna uh, stay a little bit on that point on AI and labor, right? As you had mentioned earlier, there are many observers that are concerned that AI could eventually displace low-skilled workers and even some high-skilled workers, right? We are seeing automation in the finance industry, for instance, uh, with algorithmic trading and things like that. And so um, to what extent has this already happened? And and uh, how might the impact of this AI revolution on labor be different from the, that of previous technological revolutions? I'm going to answer this, your question, and then I'm going to explain how it gets misconstrued a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so have we seen technological unemployment, like unemployment that we would confidently attribute to technology? The answer is no. Um, 
before COVID, unemployment in the United States was at its lowest historically. Then all the unemployment that became came after that obviously is attributed to the COVID fallout. Yeah. Now, should that give us, um, should that convince us that there is no problem? And should should we now just like calmly rest? No, because um, exactly to, to our question just before, the, the discussion that we had about globalization and technology, we have been seeing labor share of income going down. We have been seeing polarization of jobs. Jobs for people without college degrees have been stagnating or even declining in real terms for people without high school degree in the last four decades or so. Mm-hmm. This, is, like, this is unprecedented because the economy has been growing. The income per capita has been going up a lot in the last four decades, but people just have not um, shared in on that. So what does it mean? Like, what is it? It's, it's underemployment. So it's the, the level of labor demand going down because of globalization and because of technology and making jobs worse, uh, less well-paid, um, less quality for really large swaths of populations and workers. And also, there is also a very well-documented now uh, by, by a recent paper by Simoglu and co-authors. They're looking at online vacancies since 2010, and they're looking at, they're separating out um, industries and firms that are AI exposed. And they're seeing that uh, for, especially for firms that are pretty AI exposed, they are hiring more of people with AI skills and their vacancies of no, in non-AI roles are going down. So on net, you know, because of um, other processes in the economy, uh, we were hoping these people are still finding jobs elsewhere but we are seeing lowering labor demand for groups of workers who are not in these AI jobs. So the, the, to the very long answer to your question is yes, we have been seeing the impact of AI on skills, on labor demand and on displacement of jobs or making them worse. So it's really, sometimes you don't see it in the aggregate unemployment statistics, but you see it in wage growth, um, you see it in, um, in the labor share of income. So what is the solution then to it, right? Because I've, uh, I think like if we look at at displacement of, of workers, or as you say, like maybe underemployment or like a low wage growth, especially on the, in the unskilled side, we have seen that even for some time, even without AI, right? When the computers were introduced, or even when, um, when we look at like advanced robotics, if we look at Germany as a good example, mm-hmm. where a lot of the workers had to be retrained and, and they've, I think they've made the transition quite well from increasing the industrial robots in car manufacturing, et cetera. Um, and then another point related to this is oftentimes there are jobs that we probably would want to automate, right? I mean, there are jobs that are very dangerous uh, that, that are dirty. You don't want to become a coal miner uh, uh, and send your kids down there, right? If you can actually maybe automate it. But what is the solution then to help those people that are affected through this transition or to find a way to like um, all share in this uh, new technology uh, while still providing a way for those uh, unskilled or uh, people with low education to, to find a, a job in life? Great question. This is the million dollar, right? million dollar question, much, much more than that. So of course, reskilling is really, really important. And we need to get much better at that. Um, we need to understand two things though about reskilling. One is we cannot just expect workers to bear the cost of it. It's costly. It's not free to, uh, to spend time on that. And second is if the overall labor demand does go down, continues to go down because of technological progress, it's not going to be enough to reskill people because you you kind of you trying to keep reskilling people, growing population, the Earth's population is still growing for fewer and fewer jobs, fewer and fewer good jobs. Right. So like that's a that's a losing race. Like that's a losing proposition. The numbers are just not gonna work out there. Um, so you either then move to a place where and, and okay, let me back up actually and say that indeed there are some jobs that you would want to automate um, because of the quality of them today. But the question is when you're automating jobs, um, 
are there new opportunities in the economy that are being sprung up because of that productivity growth that you're creating? Are you creating enough of a productivity growth to create more jobs elsewhere in the economy? Because very often what we're seeing right now and what economists are calling so-so automation is the kind of automation that displaces jobs for real, but the productivity growth that comes from it is minuscule. So they don't create new uh, jobs elsewhere in the economy, new tasks for humans that come because now something is, and this is how it would work ideally. Um, some jobs are automated, something becomes easier to produce, cheaper to produce or higher quality. So people now buy more of that. Um, and there are like other roles that you hire into, or, you know, this is now cheaper to produce, consumers pay less uh, for this, so their income is free to buy more of something else. Mm -hmm. And this, in this something else, there are now new jobs. Now, if you automated some, some work, but you didn't make your product better or you didn't make it cheaper for the consumers, you just like pocket it as a, you know, as a capitalist, a little bit of that uh, shaved labor cost, you didn't create any new jobs elsewhere in the economy. So these displaced people now competing for the same amount of jobs with all these other people in the economy, right? Like, so you're creating actually a downward pressure on the work. And this is what the so-so technology does. Um, and this is the, the, going back to your question of what should we do? We should try to discourage that kind of use of AI because that's a really what they call sad use of AI. We can be, uh, we can be using AI to, to create massively uh, more productive um, um, ways to, um, to run the economy. And that would be benefiting a lot more people. You know, the other kind of parallel proposal that people really like and talk a lot about is, well, why don't we kind of like let AI run wild and it's going to generate uh, a lot of gains for a very small number of people, but then we tax that and we redistribute out and we sort of like just support all of the population that has lost their jobs or cannot be retrained because there are just no new jobs for them yeah. to be retrained for. We support them through a UBI or something like that. And, you know, I personally have absolutely nothing against UBI. I think especially in a country that has barely any social safety net, it's very important to have some floor and support for people when they go through um, whatever they, they, they're going through in life. Uh, you know, different things can happen and just like having that um, support is very important. But I think we need to be very realistic about what the society would be like and whether you can really resolve uh, the kinds of issues that we're talking about through just redistribution. And I think it's enough to walk down Market Street in San Francisco and see the kind of inequality that this city is experiencing yeah. to understand that it's very hard to solve it just with redistribution. The, um, the city budget for one homeless person goes up every year and it's, the city is still struggling to, to tackle um, this really difficult issue. So mm -hmm. we need to, uh, aside from thinking about redistribution and taxes and UBI, which are all very important and I truly support them, we need to also be thinking about how do we proactively direct technology to, by design, be benefiting more people, be creating jobs, be creating these productivity gains that are creating good jobs uh, in the broader economy. And I think you raise an important point, right? Which is quite ironic if you look at California, San Francisco, especially, which is the hub for the for the new technology. They have a huge problem with homelessness across the state, and it's a usually very progressive state. And I think one issue that people that advocate for UBI always forget is for people having a job, it's not only having the income, right? It's having purpose, having an identity, having some some pride that they can actually achieve something. And I think if you take that away that will not solve a lot of those issues. Uh, and I think that is, in my view at least, that is often really ignored when people talk about UBI. They, as you say, they build it as this great solution to, to all new technological uh, advances. I don't think it is. I think people need some, some purpose in life, right? They need to, to, to be able to like uh, work towards something. And I think that would be difficult if they just get the redistributed money, right? And, they, and the political also, right? There is a political aspect to that. It's can the um, can a democratic regime be secure and stable if you have a very very powerful 
economic elite that holds keys to a large share of your production capacity. And then the rest of the population is supported through only transfers. Like, is that a stable political regime? And this is not something that a lot of countries have gone through to, to generate to generate a very confident answer that it is. I agree, and I think it, it has the danger of which we already, I believe, we see anyway already in countries that are not democratic, but I think we also see to quite some extent, even in, in democratic countries like the United States, where we have uh, what economists call rent seeking, right? Where like very powerful companies and industries are even uh, shaping laws and regulations to perpetuate some of the economic share that they can get and increase it. And I think that really leaves out um, people that are not as well connected or, or in this interest that are not as well connected. And there's a big literature on it, on interest group politics that kind of like shows that. And, and I think AI has the potential to accelerate that quite significantly, right? So my question then is, so you, you have some really interesting ideas in your partnership, which, which I don't see in many other places being raised. One of them is you talk about directing technological change in support of what you call shared prosperity. And you suggest this is being done by correcting economic policy distortions, by trying to empower workers and influencing uh, kind of like the visions of the next generation of innovators. So can you explain a bit more these ideas? And also what I'm really curious about is how would you implement those, right? Like who is supposed to direct the technological change without mm -hmm. interfering in the marketplace, without interfering with innovation, which is very critical for, uh, for prosperity going forward? Yeah, thank you for this question. I can probably talk for hours about this. So let me try to make it um, a lot shorter than that. So I'll start from the end. How would you implement directed technological change? We actually just two days ago put out an agenda with a proposal on exactly that. Uh, it's a shared prosperity initiative agenda. And so what we're calling for is think about environmental carbon emission reduction targets. So now every respectable company puts out something like this. They commit to, to reduce their environmental footprint. So we are calling for companies who want to say about themselves that they're building AI that benefit all to move beyond principles and to commit to measuring and disclosing the impact on the availability of good jobs in the broader economy that they're making. So it, is, it would be shared prosperity targets, kind of like carbon reduction targets. You can think of yourself as good jobs positive because there are now a growing number of companies that are marketing themselves as we are augmenting people, we are augmenting workers, so we are complementing. Mm -hmm. And some of them do, and some of them, what they're doing in practice is they're observing workers to help them and to you know, suggest uh, tips for them how to do their work better. Uh, but they're observing workers, they're collecting all of this data to automate them later or to make, you know, to make exploitation and um, overreach by their employers easier. So it's not really augmentation. It's kind of like very exploitative AI, really. And for companies that are genuinely trying to complement humans, they would want to want to uh, differentiate themselves and to send a credible signal and to say, this is our impact. This is how we're measuring it uh, and, and we're disclosing it. So we are a good jobs positive uh, company on that as opposed to a destroyer of good jobs. So you're so thinking these are voluntary standards or are these regulatory standards that would be applied to everyone? And, and how would you measure that? Because I, I would imagine from an economics perspective, it's very difficult to measure your impact of your technology as one company and the rest of the, of the economy, right? How would you actually quantify that? It is, it is difficult. And this is why we wanted to uh, share it as an open agenda and invite people to collaborate with us on defining the targets and what exactly needs to go into measurement. And like, where do you stop when you are tracking down the domino effects that the technology is producing in the economy? Like at what stop you say, okay, this is far enough in terms of what is really in the direct influence of a company and we should not count it um, within, you know, their impact. Kind of like you can think about it as scope three emissions is when, you know, at some point you stop counting your emissions because this is far enough in the chain. But the carbon right. footprint is an approximation. So at some pe point people just, you know, they're making a choice um, about what they count as their own carbon 
footprint and what they don't. So here we would need to be making the same choices of what do you count as your direct economic impact on the jobs and what do you not. But um, you know, it can be used both as, um, as voluntary targets that, that companies take up, but also for regulators. So imagine you're a regulator and you want to encourage um, the kind of AI that um, is supportive of, of good job creation, the kind of AI that really um, boosts productivity in the economy, but doesn't do it through exploitative, overly surveillance uh, prone ways. You need, a way, you need a way to differentiate between the sad AI, the so-so technologies, and the brilliant AI. How would you do it? Uh, like it, it's the same by, by applying the same logic, right? And then the companies who take up targets like that and who disclose, they're, they're sending a very credible signal that you can check as a regulator. And um, your policies around uh, taxing or just like in general, you know, trying to disencourage certain types of in technologies and support different types can now be based on that data and that measurement and not only a, a, an empty promise to be augmenting humans. And yeah. then, you know, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead, please. And to your bigger question of economic um, incentive distortions and ideas of, um, of innovators, this is like, this is such an important conversation to have because these are things that really influence the direction uh, in which AI is going. And there is such a popular, you know, trope saying that technological progress is unstoppable and this is just coming upon us. And sometimes regulators get a little bit, I think, inundated and overwhelmed with all of these messages coming from Silicon Valley because, you know, and frankly, they're very self-serving, you know, from the point of view of uh, technology entrepreneurs, if you're just kind of like remove your role and you say, well, this is just happening and this is going to come to you. So you better prepare as a regulator and you better prepare to give people upskilling programs to give them UBI. Um, then there is like no responsibility on you as a company to do anything differently. But it's not true. <laughs> the um, the the, the direction of technological change is, is a subject to people's choices. It's a subject to the economic incentives. Um, so when we tax capital a lot less than we tax labor, we incentivize the investment in this automation, even, if, uh, even when it's not as efficient comparing to, to the human workers. Uh, because it's now subsidized by the, the effective tax on labor is 25%, the effective tax on capital is around 5%. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge disparity, right? So like when you're doing a calculation of what you should invest in, um, you end up investing into more machines and more automation because of these distortions, right? So we need to be mindful on, uh, about this. Similarly, you know, even things that do not seem to relate directly to technological policy choices end up influencing a lot. So if um, technology is developed in rich countries, which are by and large aging, and those countries limit, the, um, labor, limit their labor mobility rules and immigration rules, they end up with labor shortages. And you read you know, AV, autonomous vehicles, reports and proposals, and they all mention how there is a huge shortage of truck drivers in the US and it's mounting, it's growing every year. Yeah. And you know, you could issue 150,000 visas for people to come and drive trucks, or you can pour billions of dollars to automate truck driving and then eliminate, close that shortage, yes, but also eliminate 3.6 million jobs of US truck drivers. And the jobs of truck drivers around the world, where those formal sector jobs are really needed and are really scarce. Mm -hmm. And you know, the truck driving is maybe not the best example here because you could be having their 
some compensatory benefits that are very important around road safety and things like that. Right, yeah. So Which a lot of people are advocating for, right? And yeah, I think there's so, something to it, given the high number of deaths that we have on the roads every year. Yeah, I agree. So like you can be making that calculation and being like, yeah, we're going to lose these jobs, but we still want to do it. And we still want to encourage and support that technology because of these gains. But, you know, there are other um, technologies that are being developed because of the labor shortages around nursing and care, for example. And there you really need to ask, like, is this like, is this what we should be trying to do? Or should we issue more visas? You know, and, and bring people to do the care work that we don't have enough people to do, and not um, try to automate all of these jobs. Not only, with, not only domestically, but really around the world. Because once you once you've made technology knows no borders, and once something has been developed here, then you fly into uh, you fly to South Africa, you go into McDonald's, and you see a self order kiosk that is powered by AI. And you're like, what is it doing here? The, the unemployment in South Africa was 29% before COVID, before COVID. But yeah. once the company made this acquisition of over course, there, yeah. up in, in California, right, like they just deployed 130 countries, right? So, and that is just what's happening. And, and so I think I mean, there are a lot of things that, that I want to unwrap here. One is, I agree. I think when we look, for instance, something like in a care setting, and I think Japan is facing that, right? Because they have extremely restrictive immigration policies and a very aging population. So rather than let immigrants in, they're trying to develop robots that take care of the elderly, which I think is, to be frank, quite um, quite concerning because, I mean, I don't think you want anyone to take care of your uh, aging um, uh, parents or grandparents, right? Uh, that, that is a robot and it's not a human person. It's just that connection that is still missing. But the other question I had is when we look at... Um, uh, Kind of like how to direct this technological change. One problem I see with that is you would have to have perfect foresight as a regulator or whoever is in charge of kind of like giving those incentives of what the different consequences of technology will be and what the future demands will be. And that's just impossible, especially given how fast paced all the technology is developing. For instance, let's take smartphones, right? If we had tried to predict what smartphones are going to do, how they will evolve, it would have been impossible. No regulator has that information. Oftentimes, they're actually way behind the technology. So how would you would you make sure that you don't stifle innovation, right? You don't try to cut off. Maybe there is a, an innovation that would eliminate jobs, right? And on average, maybe in the short term, not create more jobs. And then you say, no, you should not pursue this. But then actually, if you had pursued the technology, there would have been a usage maybe like two, three years down the line that would have actually improved, uh, created new opportunities. I don't think you can predict that, right? How would you address that? Um, uh, I'm really concerned about stifling innovation and like cutting it off or killing it off before it actually leads to somewhere. Yeah, no, completely. You're, you're right. Like it shouldn't be some heavy handed approach there. Uh, two things I want to say on it. One is when as a government, as a regulator, you think that you're just not getting in the way and you're not regulating and you're letting technology um, <clears throat> develop its own course on its own pace. It's not, you're not actually, um, you're not actually not present because your choices around uh, tax policy, around immigration policy, around other policies, still direct innovation. And so where we are now is that they're directing innovation into excessively um, excessive levels of automation, levels of automations that are beyond socially optimal. So when you think you might you are not making choices and you're not intervening, you've actually made some choices. Um, and they are acting, they're not, they're not neutral. So that's, well, that's an interesting point. So you can think about it in a way of kind of like having a core set of principles that maybe when you develop different policies like tax policy, like immigration policy, you look at those secondary effects, primary and secondary effects to make sure maybe is this the right policy? Are there discrepancies like you mentioned in tax policy between capital and labor before, right? That would lead to that. Or is there a way that you level the playing field and then you see where the technology actually really goes? Completely. And then secondly, um, it's not, I'm definitely not calling to ban automation or anything like that, right? You, what you're trying to do is tip the scale a bit. You're trying to go away from excessive automation that dampens the 
demand for labor year after year and makes it lower and lower and lower, making it harder for you as the government to um, help the society adjust to that. So how do so, you measure that? What would you say? Who, who determines what's an excessive level of automation, right? Because that's very hard, hard to say, I would say. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly the, the big question that, that we're trying to tackle. This, it's, um, it is difficult. But what, you're, what you want to look at is, OK, what are the compensatory? Fine, you're eliminating some tasks and some jobs. Mm -hmm. what, else, what else is this technology doing? Is, the, is it uh, creating an effect elsewhere in the economy that uh, I, by how much are you raising productivity? Can we expect that there is going to be a contribution to productivity growth? And then beyond that, what is the impact on the quality of jobs in the economy? Like, is, are, are the, are, uh, is this the kind of innovation that makes workers less powerful and like strips their bargaining power within um, the workplace and that pushes the risks on them, right? Like, so you can start to differentiate some of the, uh, there are gonna be some more obvious cases when it's, it's a kind of technology that just lets um, capitalists shave some labor cost, but really does not do much else. Or, you know, it, there is also the, beyond automation, there is the labor shifting or labor pushing the labor on actual consumer. You know, what was a paid work like, cashier checking you out. Now you go into a grocery store and you are investing your own time to check you out. Or you call uh, your true. bank and instead of talking to an agent, you are talking to a robot and navigating through tons of menus, you know, over and over again. You're right. This is it's very less time. efficient from an economic perspective because it, the cost is being borne by the customer in this case, right? Instead your, of the company. The cost is borne by you. And yeah. not only you're paying for this with your own time, but you are not creating something else. You know, your no, comparative true. advantage is not in talking to a robot. You are productive in your own work. You're not doing your own work while yeah. you're doing all that, right? So there are some, some of these cases that would be, um, would not be so like on a, you know, in the gray zone in terms of um, understanding their impact on the economy. And at yeah. least those are the ones that can be more actively discouraged and the obviously good and brilliant ones that can be more actively encouraged. I think that's a really great example actually to hang it on, right? Because as you say, let's say, let's take the automation self-checkout, right? I never understood the concept because the only thing it does is it really puts the cost on, on me as a customer. I suddenly have to spend the time doing something that I don't want to do, right? And mm -hmm. it's just a, the firm uh, the firm really kind of like reduces the cost for itself. So it's a negative externality. I like that example. I think that that makes it clear to a lot of people like what kind of like way you're talking about in directing this. Um, what, one question I had is if we, if we think about the use of AI, and this is actually from the audience also that, that came up right now. Um, at, at like AI rollout worldwide, right? So the EU is coming up with some rules. Um, the US probably will come up with some policies, but then there are countries like Russia or China that really don't care. And they use AI and they will develop AI uh, in any direction they want with probably very little safeguard. We already see that in China, right? With the social credit scoring system, which is very dystopian from a privacy perspective. Um, how how do we reconcile that, right? How do we make sure that democracies maybe don't put too many rules in place that make us uh, stay behind? And then those countries that are just pushing ahead with no guardrails whatsoever, come up with innovation or AI that, that we can to keep up with. And that goes for the military realm as well, right? I mean, if you look at some of the developments already, the Russian army wants to uh, already deploy some of the AI weapon systems in, in their tank units. It's it's something that is, I think, really difficult given the divisions we face in the world today, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, I would be really wary of an AI race, but also wary of using a potentiality of an AI race or a rogue government doing something um, really bad as an excuse for democratic governments to also pursue those dangerous directions right so there got to be someone who is the leader who is setting the norms and uh, striving for something for really beneficial uses of ai for humankind and that is powerful because look um top ai talent is scarce 
So mm -hmm. they know that people are competing for them. Firms are competing, but also countries and who they want to work for and what kind of uh, goals they're pursuing is important. So I think there is really an important role for the US, for the EU to play, to be those beacons of developing AI for the benefit of humankind and mm -hmm. not to threaten um, someone uh, who, who, who might be a bad or rogue actor, because that's the way to attract idealistic, talented people to work for you and, and get ahead in these really important applications. That's an interesting point, I think. And we have seen some of that in the US already, right? I think we have seen a couple of controversies at big tech companies in the US where employees have had very different views and perspectives than the management. And said, for instance, and in, uh, no, we don't want to invest in certain military technologies or work for that or uh, things like that. So I think that's a good point because I think especially the the young generation that's coming up cares much more about that. So if you think about talent acquisition and retention, this is a key point for a lot of companies that they probably should keep in, in mind. Yeah, yeah. There's this new paper by Bao Bao Zhang uh, on the preferences of AI talent in terms of what country they, they would like to live oh, in. Oh, interesting. And okay. US, US is on top, right? So mm -hmm. US should really prioritize making sure they stay on top. They, they have this great advantage now. It's, it's really a big deal, you know? Yeah. And then whatever goals China is pursuing, but, you know, if people working there do not want to work on these goals, um, then they're going to be left without the best people, right? Like, and that's that's a big competitive edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, of course, right now these immigration restrictions for AI talent are also really difficult to navigate. So, yeah. the US is a little bit shooting itself in the foot by not letting all of these talented people who want to work there mm -hmm. um, come. I actually agree with you. I think so. We just published an article today, actually, about how. The U.S. can attract more entrepreneurship and international entrepreneurs through the immigration system because now it is very difficult. And so we are, we are turning away a lot of talent that might come here for studying and then they cannot stay afterwards. And if we look, I mean, if we look at, at, at some of the major large companies in the United States, I think the number was like 40 percent of, of those were either founded by immigrants or their children. So it's, it's a competitive advantage. That's an interesting point. I think what I really love about the conversation today is it, it's just such a complex topic that weaves together tax policy, inequality, immigration policy, and then technology. And I think, unfortunately, oftentimes our political system is not set up to deal with a lot of these complexities in a comprehensive, systematic way, right? And that's what I'm concerned about, that people are just, they're very short-term oriented, the political actors that we currently have, right? And a lot of times they, they go for short-term fixes, like you said, okay, let's maybe go for a UBI or more welfare uh, payments, but they don't look at the bigger picture. And so I think it's really important that uh, organizations like yours are thinking about these topics in a more, more comprehensive way. We're trying, yeah, and it's, yeah, you're right. It's just like the nature of the electoral process. You're thinking about your next election. And so four years is your time horizon. And what we're talking about is, is much longer term than that. And I think we need, um, what I've felt sometimes is we, we don't really have kind of like a, a lot of interactions, I think, between the policymakers that are making the regulations and then the tech world, right? The VC world, the Silicon Valley. There has been increasingly more so in the last couple of years, but I think oftentimes these technologies just grow and grow and grow and then policymakers are, are behind, at least in the US. I think the EU is a bit more proactive. So I think it's really important kind of like to, to improve those interactions and to see kind of like what, what can we actually develop in tandem with the technology on the policy front to make sure that these uh, uh, these guardrails are put in place. Completely, yeah. And you know, the, so the, the regulation that the EU put out, um, they worked first with the high level expert panel. And a lot of people there were from the industry and this was just a great model because the work was transparent. Mm -hmm. The recommendations of the panel were transparent. And it's not some kind of lobbying, you know, by tech companies that is happening behind the scenes, but a way to leverage their expertise in a transparent way. I think it's a, it, it was a, it was a well done. Kudos to them. Well, I would like to thank you because we are at the end of our talk today, but this was really interesting. Um, and I wish you and your team good luck in, in working on this very important topic for the future. And thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. And thanks so much to everyone who joined us online. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.